and welcome to a new episode of the Computomics podcast. Our guest today is a professor at the University of Bonn, where he heads the Photogrammetry and Robotics Lab. He's a spokesperson of the DFG Cluster of Excellence, PhenoRob, Robotics and Phenotyping for Sustainable Crop Production. He's co-founded three Digitech startups and runs a YouTube channel with about 45,000 subscribers. Welcome to the podcast, Cyril Stachnis. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. A bit of a lead up with the intro, um, and I left out probably uh, 95% of your accolades, but that's uh, the, the luxury and problem we have with almost all of our guests, I would say. Uh, so we like to start with a little bit of an icebreaker. Yep. And I was wondering, what's your favorite movie scene involving a robot? Oh, that is very difficult because I'm actually not the biggest movie person, I have to say. So um, I'm actually, I don't know, the last time I've been in the movies is definitely a decade ago. So I'm actually not very qualified to answer this question. I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I mean, that's the great thing about an icebreaker, even... Uh... In a case like this, it's still cool. We learn something about you. Uh, what what would be something that you do instead of going to the movies? Well, I'm more on the sports side. And so I try to be active uh, whenever I have free time because I'm actually sitting in front of the screen already mm. uh, during the whole day. So I try to be out. I try to be moving um, and spend very little time in front of screens in my free time. That's uh, that's very, very smart. <laughs> um <laughs> Well, let's let's go into more of your your main job, the stuff that you do do in front of a screen and other places. Um, yeah. As I just mentioned in the intro, you're the uh, spokesperson for the DFG cluster of excellence, PhenoRob, um, short for Robotics and Phenotyping for Sustainable Crop Production. Um, this uh, cluster of excellence is funded by the DFG, the German Research Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about the vision? What what is PhenoRob? What are your what's your purpose? Yeah. So. We can, if you want to reduce it to one single question, that would be how can we use digital technologies in order to um, make crop production less harmful for the environment and at the same point in time, do not jeopardize the demand for a higher yield, which definitely exists. So we try to use digitally inspired techniques, could be robotics, could be machine learning techniques, could be division techniques, sensor data interpretation approaches in order to provide more information about what happens on the field and then derive automatic actions in order to whatever, um, have a better management, more targeted, or in order to provide relevant information to breeders in order to make better breeding decisions. So basically trying to use those technologies to support farmers in management and also support breeders. Mm -hmm. Would you say, I mean, that's quite a range that you cover, right? Um, what would you say would be main areas of, that you're focusing on? Um, so I think we are stronger in the manage on the management side. Um, that's more the expertise of colleagues that we have. We reappointed people in plant breeding, so we try to also look more into the breeding side now, but we have a longer historical expertise on the management side. Um, the important thing or the interesting thing about the cluster maybe is that it actually brings in a lot of people. So starting from people from computer science over geodesies, other technical disciplines, um, over to people from biology, from agriculture and, um, and ecosystems um, modeling up to people working in economics. So it's a very mm -hmm. broad range of people. It's a very interdisciplinary cluster. And we are trying to actually bridge those boundaries and trying to bring in the technical expertise into the people on the kind of biology gene and also the other way around, trying to educate the technical people with what's really important in the context of crop production in order to have a more sustainable setup, um, whatever. Having a smaller footprint on the agroecosystem at the same point in time, still being able to produce what we need to produce. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned uh, the, the field management as your, your primary focus area or, or maybe area of expertise, clustered expertise within, yeah. the, within the cluster. Um, I remember ha having had a look at a web documentary on the project um, that you expressed the optimization of field management as, uh, and I'm, got, I'm, I'm translating from German, and please correct me if I misquote, as give, <laughs> yeah. giving each plant the love it needs to prosper. 
Yes, that's very nice word and very nice repetition. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, so the, the key thing in here is you want to be able to analyze every plant, so something you can't do in a traditional setup, and decide for every plant what is kind of the best action that you want to execute in order to whatever, eliminate, eliminate wheat, which is around, or keep some of the weeds, um, but eliminating others. Um, in terms of fertilization, what are very local fertilization actions you want to do? Or what needs to be done in the context of plant protection, so fighting diseases. And mm -hmm. uh, the, some of those decisions may apply a whole field, other um, may be applicable on a one by one meter um, area, but others are very specific and need very targeted intervention. And so the goal is to being able to analyze every plant at high speed and provide management action for every plant to give every plant, as you said, the larvae needs <laughs> not to prosper as good as possible. I love that. If we if we go into a little more detail here, how how can so, someone who's, who's never heard of the project, how can they envision that? Like, how, how do you actually find out, A, which plants are even there, B, uh, what kind of love they need, and C, how do you apply that love? Um, so, uh, you know, obviously breaking it down one one at a time. So um, first of all, how, how does this analysis work? How do, you, how do you track what's there? So there are different levels of complexity in this. So from my point of view, the task of um, identifying weeds and what's growing on the field is probably the easiest task. That's something that you can typically do using a camera. So you can envision that, that you have a robot or you can even think about a tractor, which is a camera mounted looking downwards onto the field and while you're driving over the field, you basically make create images or take images at a high frequency. Mm -hmm. And so in every image, you can fully automatically analyze with computer vision or machine learning techniques what every pixel actually is. So for every pixel, you can say, okay, that's a value prop. This could be whatever a maize plant or it could be a sugar beet. So whatever you are interested in growing on the field, or you can say that's background, that's soil. Or you can say, okay, that could actually be a pixel which belongs to a wheat. And um, if you have that information, you have that basically for every pixel. So for every square millimeter in your field, you know exactly what's growing there. Um, then you, of course, can take um, target action. So you could kill the wheat. You could do that by selective spraying. That would be the easiest way to do that probably. So you have a, a herbicide which you direct only to the plants or to the wheat plants, which already dramatically reduces the amount of herbicide that you need. But you can also take other measures. You could take a mechanical weeding tool in order to eliminate that plant. Or what we are experimenting with, you're using a laser and redirect a high power laser and basically burn oh, wow. away the weed at super high speed. And these are ways that you can do where you do a millimeter precise targeted intervention um, on the field, um, chemical free potentially even. Um, and this reduces the negative impact that we have on the agroecosystem. At the same point in time, allows you very targeted, very local interaction. And you can even say some of the weeds may not have a negative impact, but they're good from a biodiversity perspective. So you may want to keep them. So you, you can actually make that decision. Um, so that's part one. That's probably the easiest part because all the decisions can be made on what you see where. So it's a very, I don't want to say very simple task, but a task where it's easy to get sensor data. Mm -hmm. If we then go one step further and look into fertilization, that becomes already much more challenging because seeing based on a camera image um, what a uh, nutritional deficit of a plant is much harder because it's not as easy to see um, what is uh, whatever, yeah, some, some deficiency that the plant has. And if you see this may already be fairly late. So you need to typically combine your local perceptions with information about the soil with information about which treatment has happened before, which other crop or which crop rotation happened before. So this is additional information that you need that you cannot easily derive from your current camera image. So you need more background knowledge, which is harder to do. But if you have certain background knowledge, you can actually identify what um, deficits there exist on the field and then do a very targeted, very local um, fertilization of the ground. You probably won't need millimeter precision for that, but maybe 10 by 10 centimeters or one by one meter, something in that area is probably um, a good way for doing this. And if you go to the last level of complexity, then the diseases are the hardest thing to detect at the moment, at least for us. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is that if you see a plant disease in most cases already too late to treat them and you would actually like to treat them much, much earlier. So um, you can use other sensing technologies, not regular camera, but cameras which have 
called a multiple spectral band. So they don't see just RGB, as you know it from your mm -hmm. cell phone or uh, mobile phone camera, but um, have multiple spectral bands which go into different frequencies. And this allows you to see things we can't see with our human eye. And some of the diseases show certain patterns or signatures in these other spectral bands that we can detect the disease before we can see it with our human eye. And that's a great advantage, but this is still quite challenging to do. It's challenging to train those systems. Those multi or hyperspectral cameras are also not the easiest one to handle in the field, um, especially with sunlight and, and other effects. Mm. So there's a lot of research that needs to be done in order to then treat the field early in time. And that's kind of the different levels of complexity I would see. So weeding being the easiest part, we've made substantial progress already. Um, fertilization is the next stage and uh, fighting plant disease is probably the last stage in terms of complexity of management using mobile robots. Mm -hmm. And is, uh, is that entire range something that you're aiming to do with Phenorop within the, the current time, I guess, that, that you have with, uh, with the funding cycle? Yes, that's true. So we started with doing everything. Um, but of course, like all the clusters of excellence in the last round, the, which started 2019, they got a substantial budget cut. Um, mm. and we all lost, I don't know, something like 25 or 30 percent of our budget. Um, and so not everything is possible to be done, but we work on everything. We um, have a very good progress on the weeding side. Um, fertilization, also good progress on the plant diseases. I still there's much more which needs to be done. But again, we are hoping also to go into the next round of funding. Another seven years will hopefully um, be possible, and then we will work more on that. But we did already work on detecting certain diseases um, in the field in field environments, even with those hyperspectral sensors. So yes, we are trying to address all three areas. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested to learn a little bit more because you, you said that that's where you already are quite far with, with the research and the development uh, um, is this, the I'm going to just call it laser zapping, yeah. <laughs> laser weeding. Yeah. Um, can you can you give a bit of an insight, like how does this work? How would that be applied or are there already, is there an outlook for application? Yeah, so the outlook for application is there. That's actually one of the startups that you mentioned um, uh, in, the, in the intro. So this was a development that we have been doing here, working on the detection system for weeds since I think 2014, something like this. Mm -hmm. And um, then I had a postdoc, Julio Pastrana, who uh, spent some time here in the lab and who always had this idea, I want to build a weeding robot with lasers. So I had this idea, actually, whatever, 15 years ago already, but at that point in time, it kind of wasn't doable. And mm -hmm. so he started here in the lab and then working on that systems and then founded a startup uh, out of the university, out of Finerop. Um, which actually does this. And we today have the prototypes we are running in the second year of um, trials at end users in the US at the moment, um, where we're actually running this on real fields, fully operational. Um, so that's something that we can do already. There's still some work which needs to be done, whatever. Um, work safety certifications is still uh, something of a challenge with those systems. Um, but from the technical perspective, we actually have those systems running right now. Wow, it's exciting when you have. I mean, because that's always a challenge with with research. You have to to invest so much time, uh, and then and to to actually go into application within a relatively short time frame. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty well, cool. That's definitely a challenge. And from the first ideas, you probably need ten years until this materializes. Mm -hmm. um, but it depends a bit on the people. So I'm started to become a really big fan of startups funded out of university labs because mm -hmm. if you have students or PhD students, I mean, they're fully employed, but they're still in the time of their PhD, they are basically trained for something like five years doing really solid work in a certain area. And if they work in an area where you say, okay, that could actually be commercialized, then giving them the possibility to found a startup is it's a great idea. If, I mean, you need to have a certain mindset as a, as a person doing that, mm. but I'm in big support for that. And there exist even funding programs where the person can even stay at the university but work on their own ideas for something like nine months or even 18 months. Um, we have both of them, um, these funding programs such as Exist or, uh, or EFRA, and then they can work on their own ideas and use the expertise in the lab and turn that into a startup. And that worked really well. So we have uh, three startups came out of the lab in the last five years, and um, that's great. And it, it's also great from the university perspective because I still have a lot of insight in what's going on, what are practical problems. We can still support the company because there's a close collaboration, but they also feed information back because they are still in the same environment. We are still can test our stuff on their commercial system. And that's mm. a great benefit for both sides. But of course, you need the students which are interested in that. 
Um, and you need the environment and the ecosystem which supports this. But um, I'm very happy with the setup that we have in Bonn here. It's a lot of flexibility in these um, possibilities to fund companies. And that's great. And I, I'm, I really like that. Mm -hmm. And it's much better compared oh. to, sorry. No, I was, was going to say, understandably so. It sounds like an ideal setup. <laughs> yeah, it's better, often better compared to working with an industrial partner. So we also have some industrial partner, which is great. But there often is a flow of information just in one direction. And mm -hmm. with those startups where the people work with me or with other team members for whatever, five years, there's just a different matter of trust and there's a much more bi-directional exchange. Mm -hmm. And this is something I really appreciate. And there's much more possible in terms of information exchange compared to larger companies where you do basically research on a certain project together with them, but you get very little insight about what's going on. That's much closer with startups. And that's something I, I really do like. Of course, at some point in time, the companies get larger and this kind of vanishes, but um, right. it's still a very good transfer in both directions from the university lab into the startup, but also the other way around. Right. You probably want, want a mix of both, I guess. Where you know you, you have that that level of of detailed exchange, bi-directional exchange, and uh, and more intense working relationship, um, and then also maybe bigger partners that come with other advantages. But of, of course, doesn't yes, make sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So of course, larger companies typically have a larger budgets for research. So with the startups, it's mm -hmm. basically mutual interest. There's not that much uh, financial exchange between the labs and the startups. Um, yeah, but yeah, both things have their pros and cons, but. It's something which I, I mentioned this probably explicitly because I underestimated the value of that um, mm -hmm. 10 years ago. So when I started to become a professor nine years ago now, I was not really thinking of that startups would be a great benefit for the lab or I was just pretty uncertain about that probably. Mm -hmm. um, but it turned out that the benefit was much larger for me as a person um, from the, the insight it generates. Um, so I underestimated that before. Mm -hmm. Interesting aspect for sure. Um, I, I was thinking with, with regards to application, um, do you, can you already foresee with the other two uh, steps we talked about? So, so recognizing maybe, uh, fertilization, soil issues, and yep. then also the diseases, um, what direction are you taking there? Um, maybe what methods are you trying to apply as far as machine learning is concerned? Mm -hmm. Um, how, how, what's the, what's the road that you tend to take in that direction? Yeah. So, um, from in the weeding example, we really use standard machine learning techniques to use in computer vision today. So these are neural networks typically, which solve so-called semantic segmentation tasks or panoptic segmentation tasks. So you want to look into instances. So how many plants do you actually see? And for every pixel, decide what is it, what I'm actually seeing. And um, this is also something that translates to the, um, to the fertilization side. So here we typically use a lot of drones, which can cover a larger area easily and provide very detailed information about what's going on. And then we take that sensor data, what we are seeing, and basically marry that with more traditional models, um, which use background knowledge for um, ecosystem modeling. So they are large groups, especially in the research center, ULIC, which is also part of the cluster. They are groups which look into all the for example, nitrogen fluxes in the ground and what's the, the flow of nitrogen, um, what is probably stored in there. And they have mathematical models. They're not black box machine learning models. They are more a knowledge engineered models, but also fed with a lot of data. And you try to combine those, um, those model, models with background knowledge with the sensor observation that you get from the field in order to estimate if whatever a certain pattern that you're seeing on the plant is could be generated from a um, nitrogen deficiency, for example, or if this could have other courses. So there you're trying to combine these existing models that we have with the direct data interpretation models that work on the drones. And um, if you then look into the plant diseases, again, we are in the area of um, deep learning. Um, the only difference is that you don't use a regular three channel camera images in the input, but maybe um, 25 channel or even 200 channel um, input stream of data, which makes the, um, the networks more complex because they have much more input to handle. Um, but you also try to make an anal analysis saying for every location, if the leaf you're seeing or the plant that you're seeing is probably affected by disease. And um, there, the, the tricky thing is detecting things early enough and then having appropriate measures on fighting them. But 
especially if you want to fight those measures. So if you use a pesticide to spray a field, for example, you would anyway spray a fairly large area or a larger area to avoid the spread of the disease. So here you don't need this very local um, application, which you need for weeding, for example. Mm -hmm. But from the data interpretation point of view, that is, again, um, a machine learning task where you use uh, deep learning models in order to perform semantic segmentation in images. And now I think we've 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 covered quite well the the field management yeah. aspect. So the major uh, focus area or the main um, the, the the expert cluster within the cluster. Um, I'd like to to spend just a little time on the phenotyping side yeah. as well. So um, I mean the other side you mentioned is is trying to create more resilient plants. Um, yeah. And with regard to phenotyping, what uh, methods do you use? Uh, to improve and, and automate that, or what technologies? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are trying to do phenotyping in the field. So we are not that much looking into operations in lab or in, in glass houses. They are already companies which provide really good services where you basically bring the plant into the sensor. We are trying to do that really outdoors in real world um, field environments, and we are trying to bring the sensor to the plant. So this can be done via robots or actually more often via drones because they're much easier to operate. So we work a lot with standard drones you can buy, um, whatever. Any standard drone you use for making cool YouTube videos, you can actually buy them and attach a proper camera to them. And then you have information where you can get very detailed, super high resolution imagery today of breeding plots, for example. And then you, again, start to analyze what you're seeing. And there are certain phenotypic traits which are relevant if you want to compare different breeding plots. So you have those plots where different varieties are planted, and you want to have a very objective, um, high-resolution analysis of what's going on. And this depends basically on the breeding task. So we're working here together with, with breeding companies, and there's also another startup, PhenoInspect, which is actually doing this and providing this service even to breeding companies today where depending on what, which kind of traits the breeding company is interested in, we are trying to build models, machine learning models, which actually provide that information. This could be things like um, counting leaves, leaf size, um, leaf area index, uh, certain spatial signatures that could be emergence counting. This could be estimating heights, estimating angles um, of the leaves with respect to the stem curliness of, of leaves. So there are different phenotypic traits that we can extract out of the camera images. Sometimes we need multiple camera images from different viewpoints if geometry plays a role. Um, so then we combine these um, neural networks with traditional photogrammetric 3D reconstruction techniques, basically building 3D models of the plant in order to really have the shape and then combining them with learning techniques to combine geometry and semantics in order to um, identify the traits which are relevant. Although I have to say that typically we are more likely to get a list of, we would like to measure that, and we provide that service, mm -hmm. um, but we're also looking into what are potential traits that we don't know yet um, that maybe help us to make some predictions. So this is more blue sky research or more on the exploratory side. Mm -hmm. um, this is not what you typically offer to a company, but we are still exploring what other traits could be or verify certain traits um, for field experiments. Um, yeah, and so the great advantage, which is also in kind of an unexploited potential from my point of view, if you compare how breeding companies do their um, analysis at the moment, you basically have a human which goes to the breeding plots, samples a few plants and analyzes those plants, mm -hmm. performs certain measurements and whatever stores this measurement in an electronic device or mm -hmm. even on a piece of paper in the old days. Um, but now, consider that a few years has passed and you want to analyze the plants that you see right now compared to the plants that you have three years ago, for example. You can do this analysis over time only based on that recorded data that's very, very limited. Um, mm -hmm. If you, however, recorded high-resolution imagery, you can go back and even use the machine learning models in which are available in three years, which will be much better to process the data you recorded before and have a very objective comparison about what's the status, whatever, in this year compared to previous years where maybe the environment conditions have been different. And there's also a great, and I'm not sure how much exploited resource right now that this um, raw data recording and analysis, fully automatic analysis of that data uh, will provide us as relevant information in the future. I'm, I'm a strong believer that this will make Another difference that we don't see right now, if we only look into the data we record right now on breeding plots or in the field. Right. 
Yeah, uh, you you almost anticipated my final question, which would have been, <laughs> or or let me let me uh, iterate it in case in case you have another future outlook. So so yeah, what what developments do you see, like maybe three to five to ten years down the line, um, knowing what you know now with the the results you have so far, um, that could be you know high impact areas, the 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 blues the bluest of blue skies. Okay, so there, there are a lot of interesting things you can do if you have the possibility to assess the status quo at every point in time. You can build much better models, you can make much better predictions and kind of nail down or reduce a lot of uncertainty you have in this equation of how the plant is actually evolving. If you can control your environment better, you know more about your or can assess a phenotype in, 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 a, in an easier manner. So you can make draw more conclusions. That's a bit of a generic answer, but I think we will see a lot of developments coming down the line. But you can also think of completely new field arrangements that may pop up. Again, that's blue sky research. A lot of tasks which need to be solved for that are still uncertain how to do that. But if you think about whatever patch crop experiments where you try to combine um, different crops on the same field and you do really uh, intercropping where every plant next to each other is a different one. If you can monitor those plants with camera data, plants specifically and treat them plants specifically, um, that gives you new opportunities, which may provide very interesting insights from an ecolog ecological perspective or from biodiversity perspective. Of course, it's unlikely that all the fields that we see in the future will be a uh, patch crop that's very unlikely to happen. I'm not claiming that. But these systems allow you to do new things you couldn't do before. It starts with generating certain seeding patterns of which seeding pill to put where to grow something to a treatment um, that you can do very plant specifically, um, even if every second plant is a different one. There are still a lot of challenges down the line, like how do you harvest a field like that, um, which, is, which is unsolved yet. And harvesting is still an issue with those robotic systems if you need to move a lot of mass from A to B of the field. Robotics mm. robots also come to their limits. Um, but um, these are new interesting opportunities where we don't know at the moment where they will bring us. And I think especially with respect to biodiversity, with respect to ecological improvements, there are still a lot of new things that robots can do in terms of optimizing whatever yield or certain things. Traditional automation techniques do already a pretty good task. Um, let's see how far we can go. But I think in terms of this, what is the impact, measuring impact, quantifying what does it actually mean from mm -hmm. an ecological perspective, more than, more than saying, uh, if you use less herbicides, that's better for the environment. Can we actually quantify that in a better way and then optimize our decisions in order to have or reduce the impact that we have on the agroecosystems? These are important things which are down the line, which I expect to change in the next, let's say, 10-year horizon. Thank you, Cyril, for giving us this outlook, as well as deeper insight into how Phenorob gives each plant the love it needs to prosper. To our listeners out there, feel free to check out the show notes to this episode on computomics.com. We will link to the Phenorob project page, as well as the other resources we mentioned, so you can go even more in-depth into Cyril's many projects. Perfect. Thank you very much. It was a really a pleasure. And I think we should meet again in five years, listen to this episode <laughs> again and see what the predictions look like. <laughs> I, yeah, I'd love that. I think that, I mean, we just said, right, to compare stuff on a, on a longer timeline is always, is always interesting. So um, <laughs> why, not, why not make it a date now? Um, I'll uh, remind you maybe four and a half years from now, and then That's we'll set up a perfect. concrete date. I have a very good calendar, which looks very far into the future. So four or five years is not a problem on my side. <laughs> All right. It's a date then. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs>